Uh, and now, with great pleasure, I'd like to welcome back uh, Drisco Trevich, who is here today with a colleague, Tracy uh, from Quest Law, and I'll leave Drisco to introduce Tracy more fully and to uh, speak. Thank you both so much. This, is, by the way, is Dushko's third presentation. <laughs> you can sit here, you can sit here, Tracy. Either or. Either or. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having us here. We're we're going to try not to be boring today, um, as I usually am boring. So forgive me for that. Um, the um, discussion is going to be centered a little bit more about um, around the legal matters and, and duties and roles of an executor, what they need to do and how they need to conduct your affairs, if you will, after somebody passes. So just give us a second. I'm going to get Tracy's presentation start because she's going to talk first. That was the coin toss that we had. <laughs> I'm not sure if I won or lost. <laughs> <laughs> So anytime today will be awesome and from beginning. There. So Tracy, floor is yours. All right. Well, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm not used to sitting, so I will. Gonna uh, talk to the mic, unfortunately. Oh, oh should I have a smooth in? There we go. There we go. Um, so it's gonna be different. I apologize. That can't see very well, but um, the so today I'll talk to you about, as Dushko said, a little bit about estate planning documents, so will of attorney and personal directive, and uh, also if uh, we have a little bit of time or if you have questions about acting as either a personal representative, as Dushko alluded to, or executor. Um, or also what the responsibilities are of agents and attorneys for the power attorney and the personal directive. Um, I did, for those of you that are here, um, I passed out a little handout. On the one side is a summary of the slides and the information I'll be sharing. And on the other side, there are some spaces. If you had any questions, um, if you wanted to jot down some things that strike you or are particularly relevant to you, or if you have, like I said, if you have questions, feel free to write them down. You can ask questions here today, um, or if you want to send me an email or give me a phone call, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so first of all, We'll start with yeah. The, again, the documents are the will, power attorney, and personal directive. Um, I will uh, again. Most of you are quite familiar with these terms, if not uh, exactly what each document is. But a will is a document that we use when a person passes away. Um, the power of attorney and the personal directive, on the other hand, are both for use when a person is alive, but they no longer have either the mental or the physical capacity to be able to manage with their affairs on their own and they need assistance. So that's those. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about the will. We know that we use the will when somebody passes away a will gives you a few different um, options. First of all, it lets you name the person who you would like to or the people who you would like to act on your behalf and manage your affairs and distribute your estate. So um, this is your opportunity to choose somebody who you feel would be um, able to reach out and get the necessary help. Um, people such as Dushko at the funeral homes are very, very helpful and very well versed in many of the responsibilities of a personal representative. So that's a great place to start. Um, generally speaking, it's not uncommon for that person to also need to hire a lawyer or just talk to a lawyer about a few different things. And an accountant is somebody else that we often see uh, utilized by the executor. So 
You want somebody that doesn't necessarily have all the knowledge and skills, but somebody that can reach out and will be able to, to do these things and manage them on the behalf of the estate. I did see a couple of people coming. I can so, grab that. Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure they have the, the form. Um, the other thing is um, the will gives you the opportunity to be able to dispose of your estate however you wish. So um, there's a couple of things here that are really important. Uh, one, one of those things is becoming more and more important, uh, not so much for many of your generations, but definitely for, for generations after. And that is, you want to be able to dispose of your estate and give it to those people who, uh, who you want to benefit. Um, and what I've been alluding to is the term children. So many people say, well, I want to divide my estate equally between my children. And that's very, very common, or sometimes not equally between my children. But what people don't often realize is children, or who your child is, in the eyes of the law, is very, very specific. Children encompasses only those who are born by you, so your children by blood, or children you've adopted. So if you've been, uh, you know, if you've raised a child since they were a baby or many times since they are older, and you consider them your child, in the eyes of the law, they are not your child. And the reason why I bring this up is because if you don't have a will and you die, then the uh, governing legislation, the Wills and Succession Act, states that your estate will be divided a certain way. And um, typically the way that it works is if one spouse dies, then the entire estate will then be left to the surviving spouse. If there is no surviving spouse, then the estate is left to your children. But what happens if both spouses die? Then your estate goes to your children. And if you don't have children, it goes to your parents. And if you don't have parents, then it goes to siblings and on and on and on. Yeah. So there is legislation in place that will uh, ensure that if somebody applies to the court for a grant, that that person would be able to distribute. But you would have no choice who that person is, and you would have no say in how your estate was distributed. But it could be distributed. So. The, the story that floats around often or what we're often asked is, if I die and I don't have a will, does the, does the government benefit and do they get all of my estate? The answer generally is no, they don't. But somebody, and you don't choose that person, will be responsible to uh, move forward. Uh, and again, we've just covered most of this, but who the personal representative is, Another question that we're asked from time to time thank you, is uh, what if I don't have somebody that I want to name as the representative or as the executor on my estate, then what do I do? So that here it says a personal representative is a person or an institution appointed. The testator is you, the person who makes the will, and who will do that? So if you don't have a family member or a very close friend or, or somebody that you want to name, then it is often possible to name uh, a, a corporate, what we say, a corporate executor or an institution uh, who, who will act on your behalf. Uh, many of the major banks have the state departments, so like Scotiabank has Scotia Trust, Royal Bank has Royal Trust, TD Trust, and they do offer those services. There are also independent firms such as Concentra Trust who will do the same thing. So if uh, you or somebody you know has put off preparing a will just because you don't know who to name or you don't have or they don't have somebody to name, let them know that there are alternatives and that it might be a good idea to talk with a lawyer and find out who or talk with their, their financial advisor or their banker and find out who they can name so that they're not left scrambling only because they don't know what to do. Um, 
again, that person, that personal representative that you name, they don't have to have all of the skills. Um, in my will, it names one of my sons. I can promise you that son doesn't have the legal expertise, nor does he have the financial expertise to file my income tax or anything like that. But he does have the wherewithal to be able to reach out to those who can and uh, and he would be he wouldn't be expected to do everything perfectly he would be he would be expected to do everything within his abilities and within his areas of expertise it would be those accountants and the lawyers and other people that are expected to also act within their realm and, and to be able to to uh, manage their portion of the assistance within their expertise. Like, like in my will, I made my sister my person, yeah. main personal representative, then I have two co-representatives, right. my, yeah. my niece and nephew. Right, and that's a really good idea, yeah. especially with when we name sisters and brothers because they're not getting any younger, just like we're not getting any younger. So it's uh, absolutely a good idea to have maybe somebody the same age or re relatively the same, but then also to have somebody else as a backup. Um, because when we do these documents, we're, our intention is usually to, to make sure that the documents are prepared in a, in a way that they're not going to expire, not expire, but that they'll they'll still be usable and there, there won't be complications. So we like to, to suggest or recommend that um, there's always an alternative, just like you mentioned, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, enough for the will for now. Power of attorney. So a power of attorney there are different types of powers of attorney. And what a power of attorney is, is it gives somebody the authority to deal with financial matters. A general overarching power of attorney will be, uh, will be a document that would give the person you name the authority to act on your behalf in regards to all financial matters. So that means if you have real property, so if you have a house or a cabin or land, they can manage that, they can sell it, they can mortgage it, they can refinance it. They can also deal with all of your pensions, your savings. They can make sure that all your bills are paid. They can talk with the CRA. They can do your taxes, but not only just file, they can actually talk both ways. That is a general power of attorney. And that's what we, we most often prepare. Sometimes people have powers of attorney that are very specific. So they might give somebody the authority to do one thing, such as um, if somebody is traveling out of the country, some of you may know people that are gone for the winter, maybe they're selling a property. So they could give power of attorney to somebody that's here so that that person could sign on their behalf to sell that property while they're away. And that power of attorney would be for that one thing only. Another type of, of very restrictive power of attorney that many people have, and um, I think aren't always aware of the restrictive nature, is they have a power of attorney with their bank. And so they deal, I'm just going to throw out a name, they deal with Scotiabank. And so they go to Scotiabank and they say, I want this person to be able to deal with all of my accounts here. Each financial institution probably has, I, I can't say every single one, but many of them have the authority uh, within the institution. You can fill out a document. So if it's Scotiabank and you go to Scotiabank and you have all of your banking there, you can fill out a document that will allow them to give another person access. Now that's not making your accounts joint. It's keeping your accounts the way they are, but it gives somebody else the power of attorney to be able to manage your accounts there. But that person only has that authority. So they can't deal with the CRA with that power of attorney. They can't take it to a different bank. They can't do your taxes. They can't do, deal with your pensions or any of your bills from the billing side. All they can do is 
make sure that funds are deposited or withdrawn or bills are paid or transfers are made. They can only do those things there. So if that is something you have, just be aware that it's very restricted to those things only. And yes. Oh, did I go? There we go. There you go. The personal directive is like the companion document to a power of attorney. So if somebody loses capacity, whether it's uh, in, in the case of the power of attorney, generally speaking, it's uh, they don't no longer have the mental capacity, but sometimes it's just the physical capacity. The personal directive is also the same type of document. Uh, usually it's, it's the cognitive capacity that uh, somebody loses. And they need assistance with giving instruction to their healthcare providers. So you can name or appoint an agent, and you can have a backup who would be able to give medical um, direction on your behalf. Um, this person, it's it's uh, really a good idea. It's quite important that you understand that a person that a person acting on your behalf in regards to a personal directive. We call that person your agent. Your agent isn't permitted to give instruction to your medical service providers based on what they think you should do or what they believe. The instructions provided should always be the instructions of what you believe and what you feel very strongly about. And when it comes to healthcare matters, there are certain things that people are very, um, are very clear in their own beliefs and in their own wishes that may or may not be um, <coughs> the same beliefs as the person that they name. So it, it's really important that that person that you name or the people that you name understand and know if you say things like, I want to remain in my home as long as it is reasonable. Reasonable is defined differently between all of us. Some of us would think it's reasonable as long as I can still move about on my own. Other people would say, no, nope, even if I have confined to a hospital bed, I still want to be home at home. It's reasonable as long as somebody can still come into the home and deal with my medical issues. Like there's different, there's different definitions. So it's, and so it, that person that you name really needs to understand what are your definitions. Um, other, other matters that can be conflicting is sometimes people are really comfortable with having their organs and or tissues donated uh, donated if they are able to be. The person acting on your behalf may not believe in that. So those are things that this document speaks to and that this document provides some clarity uh, whether you want to be kept on life support or whether you want, don't want to be kept on life support, should you be in a persistent vegetative state or a comatose state. So, um, so this is really um, what I like to call kind of an assurance document so that it gives that person that is speaking on your behalf the assurance that these are your wishes. You do not wish to be kept on life support, or you do, or you aren't comfortable with donating organs and tissues, or you are. And that just alleviates the pressure off of somebody making those decisions without your, <coughs> um, without your direction and just wondering, is this the right thing? So it's, it's really a, a nice document to have, um, not only to make sure, again, that you're naming the and person. And what, what happens when you lose, lose uh, capacity? then uh, yes. agent helps in. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So it's it's important to have it there. Uh, again, like I said, it works in conjunction with the power of attorney. Um, the will, I did talk a little bit about if you do not have a will, what happens? We have legislation in place and that legislation says this is who can apply. We, we just went through that with my mom. Yes. And yeah. And, yeah. If, and if there is if there isn't one, we have a backup. In the case of a personal directive and a power of attorney, there are there is no legislation that is available. So if you lose capacity and you don't have these two documents, then the people that are trying to manage your estate, that are trying to assist, that are trying to make sure your bills are paid and make sure that your medical um, needs are being looked after and your instructions are being given, 
those people, uh, whoever wants to do that would have to apply to the court to apply through the Office of the Public Trustee and Guardian, and the application would be for an application for a guardianship or trusteeship. And I can tell you, I don't know, uh, I know since COVID there was a big extension of time and many of these departments have caught up again, but I can tell you it's usually about a four to six month term to get that approval through the court from the application time. Um, it is a very lengthy application. I don't do them, some of my colleagues do. The uh, person who applies, hopefully there's only one. If there's more than one, there can be some conflict between the people. No, I don't need to do it. No, I need to do it. No, dad always got me to do the banking. No, dad always got me to do the banking. And it could be a real mess for somebody to sort out. So again, it's much easier if these documents are just there, ready to go and in place. Um, for all of those reasons, it's uh, really, really a good idea. Um, some people, and I, and I understand there's reasons that they don't want to prepare these documents and they wait and they wait and they wait and they, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, and it doesn't get done. And then we get the phone call that says, well, you know, mom just got pneumonia and she was okay, but now she's not okay and she can't do these things and we need help. Um, unfortunately, it's too late if the person has no capacity and is not able to communicate with us as lawyers and is, is not able to give instructions. So uh, they need to be prepared while a person has capacity and a person can still speak on their own behalf. Um, choice, you want to do it because it gives you, again, choice. Uh, it gives you peace of mind. Once they're done, you know they're done. It's not always the most pleasant task. and. Paying for them is probably the least pe pleasant part of it. It's kind of like I always say, buying curtains or towels. Who wants to spend money on curtains or towels? Not me. But once it's done, I'm happy that it's done. And uh, it's a lot more efficient. It's a lot quicker. And the cost is far, far, far less to have them prepared beforehand rather than trying to catch up later. So what would, what would the, the consequence be? Let's say I, I don't have these documents prepared. I have a will, but I don't have the other documents prepared, for example. And I have a stroke and I can't make decisions on, on, on my own. That means that my kids, if, if, they're, if, if I was nice to them while they were growing up, they would hopefully take care of me. Yeah. But they would not be able to access my money, uh, any of that kind of stuff. So everything nope. would come out of their pocket. And they can get reimbursed after from the estate after the, the um, process is finished. Well, I know who, it's a very general question. Yeah, right? who pays for things and how that those matters are dealt with? There's so many different yeah. scenarios that it's hard to uh, hard to say what happens. But the the main the main point that we like to make sure that people are aware of is that it's not easy. <laughs> no, yeah. people, you know, gone are the days where everybody deals with this bank in this community and they know you and your kids and your parents and your aunts and uncles and your sisters and brothers. It's not the way anymore. Nobody, we don't, we don't operate that way. I used to work at a bank and, and uh, this is 30 plus years ago and we knew who our clients were. And even if somebody had an NSF check, you got a report in the morning and you could say, oh, Frank Bob. Smith, yeah. he's always good for it, or I've got a standing order, I can just transfer money from this account, he's a little bit forgetful, and you can just put that check through. Now, if you're a penny out, forget it, they're sending it back. There's no human, there's nobody knows anybody, and there's no human interaction or reasonableness anymore. So this falls into that same category. It's it's really, it, the, the onus is on us to make sure that, and, and really the power of attorney and the personal directive, it's in your best interest. You're doing the documents so that it gives somebody else the ease and the and the comfort of knowing they're there and being able to access them. But really, it's for your benefit because it's your bills that are getting paid or not getting paid. It's your rent. Like, are you getting kicked out on the street because you haven't paid rent for four months because you have no power of attorney? Like, it's it's those things, right? So it, it really is. It really is for your own benefit. Did you have a question? I do, yes. 
Um, so with any of these documents, if they are self-prepared, do they have as much legal validity as one that's done by a lawyer, for example? That's a really good question. So a, a will, a power of attorney, and a personal directive, there are, you can do them all on your own. Absolutely. Um, Dushko yeah. and I were just at a, a session on Sunday and I gave the example of my transmission. So I have three sons, they're all very mechanically inclined, they do everything for me, so that's probably why this comes up. But uh, I'm driving my car, my transmission goes, can I replace it myself? Absolutely. I can go to the parts store, I can put in my vehicle description, I, as long as I know what size engine, it's a manual transmission, I can order a transmission, I can have it delivered to my house. Then I can go to YouTube, I can look, how do I put it in? I can follow all those instructions. I can take that transmission, I can take out the old one, I can put in the new one because I know all the tools are in the garage. Should I do that? Absolutely not. There is absolutely no question in my mind that is a bad idea right from the beginning. That is what I would say about these documents. Do you need a lawyer? No. Need, I guess, is a word that we need to define. But do you need a lawyer? No. Should you have a lawyer? Yes. And I'll only say that not, and you know, I'm happy to do these things for anybody. I'm happy if anybody gets them done by any other lawyer. When the documents are prepared personally, there's a number of issues. Sometimes what happens is people go to that same internet that could tell me how to change my transmission and they pull up a power of attorney and they follow whatever instructions are there. They don't know where they're getting that information. These documents are all governed provincially. So they must conform with the Alberta rules and the statutes and the regulations of Alberta. It, what you're pulling up could be from Alaska, could be from New Zealand, could be from Nova Scotia. They're not the same and there's no guarantee that they will be the same. The other part is um, if you do it on your own, but one thing I will say, please, 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 do not ever, ever go to a registry's office and fill out a do-it-yourself will kit, personal directive, or power of attorney. Absolutely never. There are so many issues. Um, in Alberta, you can prepare a handwritten will. That will needs to be in your own handwriting, not your daughter's, not your wife's, not your sister's. Your handwriting, signed and dated by you period. But there are many aspects of a will that you would think, oh, okay, well, I gave my house to this person, I gave my car to this person, I gave my bank accounts to this person. Well, you might have forgot, oh yeah, I have shares over here, or I have this pension, or I have... There's things that lawyers will ask you all these questions, and they'll say, and even what's part of your estate? You some um, I can tell you that anything with a beneficiary on it, or anything that's joint, you can't give that to anybody except for the person that you gave the beneficiary who you named as your beneficiary, they get that automatically. So there's there's all these things that we just don't know unless we do this every day. And the same with the power of attorney. Um, there can be issues because you have a house, you wanna sell the house, you did a handwritten power of attorney and you are not handwritten, but you filled one out on the internet and you gave your son the power of attorney so he can sign on your behalf Lo and behold, you lose capacity. He goes to sell your house. There's no clause in it that says he can deal with real estate. The Alberta Land Titles Office will not accept that power of attorney unless there is a clause in there that says it can also be used for real estate. So there's all these little things that we can't expect to know. I mean, all of you are experts at something, but if this isn't it, please don't do this. Stay, do what you're ex expert in, and I will come to you for that. You come to me for this. Same, same. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, so we have a will, but we need to change some things. Yeah. And uh, we have a will prepared by a lawyer, but that lawyer is not around here. Right yeah, same as physicians, dentists. Yeah. They all so get old and retire. What do we do? What do we need to do? What do we require? Um, I would just call it, call another, call, call me, call another lawyer, and you can share the document that's already been prepared. Um, generally speaking, almost without question, we would just prepare a new one. Uh, but it's helpful to have the old one because if you're just changing a few things, then you've got all the spellings of the names and you've got all those things in there. So it is helpful to have that as a as a guide. But typically, like I would go through all the same questions with you that I would go through with anybody else. So the this lawyer, when I asked him that, was it prepared to go across those seven hundred dollars? Yeah. 
but no need to change one name. Yep. You have to do the whole world. Yep. How old is it? A year. Oh, a it's year. only one year old? And the lawyer's not there? And there's nobody in the office that would, because you could, if you're just taking out or adding some. It's legal shield. Oh. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I've not used them, so I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, see, if I prepared a will for you and you wanted to change something and it was just one name and it was like, remove this paragraph, enter yeah. this paragraph, yeah. then we can do something called a codicil. And that's just like an amendment. Yeah. But you can't just cross out your the, the line on the will because any change must conform with the same formalities that the original will did. And that would be two witnesses plus the person who prepared the will being in the same room at the same time. It's like all there's a there's a bunch of different things. So you can't unfortunately just change it. Is it like you're changing it from Sam to Jack? Or is it did somebody get married or die or divorce? Because if it's just their name that changed, yeah. don't worry about it. Okay. Like my maiden name is Tracy Hoyland. If my mom's will says Tracy Hoyland gets my toothbrush, I'm the same person. So that doesn't matter. So but if it's not Tracy anymore, if my brother Chris is going to get the toothbrush. That needs to be changed. So, is there a change in the executor? Uh, yeah, you would have to change, like 100% change it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, recently, uh, my physician gave me the green. Oh, yeah, green yeah, sheet. Fill out and that too. Yeah. Apparently, for emergency stuff or the yeah. ambulance or whatever. Uh, what kind of status does that have? So I have a will of addition, you know. I'm the kind yeah, of yeah. So that the document that you fill out with a physician is called a goals of care, yeah. and it's a very lengthy document. It's got very specific, very. Um, yeah. it, it's it's. I couldn't fill it out. It, you'd have to have medical a background or maybe yeah. a medical practitioner. So you would fill that in with your physician, and it goes together along with the personal directive. And you put the personal directive with the goals of care in the green sleeve. And that way, if you're, you know what, the, the drill, if emergency services come, they take it off the fridge and they've got everything right there. So they go in, they work together in conjunction okay. with one another. Great question. The lady think, in the corner had a question. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I have two questions for you. Can you nominate a alternate person Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It, and again, we, we usually recommend that there is a, a, a first person and an alternate for all of these documents. That way, if something happens, the first person dies or... But it has to be your, someone of blood. You can... No, it can be anyone. It can be anyone. Well, by what the lawyer told me that did my will, my power of attorney and my... Uh, right. My personal directive, I can't, you can't have a brother in law at okay. your door, uh, door, um. I'm not sure what yeah. the circumstances were around that conversation, but typically yeah. you can name anybody you we, want. And I'm we sorry. have a few questions, so I'm going to moderate yeah. it. Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. My second question is uh, if the person is not able to communicate, can any doctor who provides care? I I'm I can't answer a question what the doctors uh, I don't know what the medical practitioners rules of um, of practice are so I would think that that would be within their rules of practice not our like that that's not me I I don't know what they I don't know what they can request or not in another country I can't speak for another profession. I don't know what their rules are. And especially when you're talking, talking cross border from one country to another, if what the doctor can request, I don't know. I really have no right. way to answer that question. So uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, so somebody like I, I went abroad and I'm in, in Arizona and all something happens and 
I am in the hospital, uh, not not communicating, not being able to communicate. Can like the the doctor should follow somebody's directive. So, my understanding of the question is, can the doctor demand to see a power of attorney or a personal directive? I mean, I would think that the doctor would, but I'm speculating, and I yeah. I would rather not speculate. I I don't know what what they can or can't or should or shouldn't do. Every single situation is so specific to those facts of that situation. We'll go to uh, Larry and then okay. And then Dushko has. That's I know okay. Dushko. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, quick. The issue of names of potential beneficiaries. Right. I have a transgender niece. Okay. The old name is still on the will. Right. Does yeah. that cause a problem potentially? No, because the person is still close to. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there will be documentation, and there would be history. There would be name change documentation. And typically, people are within a family, so you know who that person is, right? It's not, yeah. yeah. Go to Victor yeah. and then Jan on the line. Sorry, Jan, okay. I didn't even know enough. Okay, so a bond. Yes. Um, I'm under understanding that in order to get my sister in Ottawa to be my executor, she has to put out a bond what my estate is worth here in Alberta. Well, I just heard from another person, that's not true. You're correct. In Alberta. In Alberta. Yeah, you're correct on both accounts. Is your property in Alberta? Yes. Okay, not in Ontario, just no. your sister is in Ontario. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the court can always at any point request that the, that the personal representative be bonded. Bonded such as insured, just like cleaning when people are bonded to go in your house. Um, so what the estate wants to do is the estate or what the court wants to do is make sure that the beneficiaries are protected. So there are a number of factors, but typically there are two things that happen. And often when we draft the will, we add a clause that the person that you've named has the authority to act without bond. Because you wouldn't name that person if you didn't trust them and you didn't think that they would be able to manage the estate without being insured. That's not always on there. And even if it is, the court, as you mentioned, has the authority to order that the, that the person still be bonded. The other way around that, A, she can be bonded. Um, it's quite cumbersome and it involves other steps in, um, in administering the estate when that happens. The other easier way to do it, and this will depend, oops, this will depend on your family and your situation and what's going on in your with your estate, but the other um, option Sorry, is, no, no, okay. is I'm always getting in trouble for touching things. This, this sitting, I'm actually really impressed that I've sat for this long and I can't sit very long at all. But um, the, the other way around it is the beneficiaries just waive, they waive the requirement for, for bonding. So it's just a simple form, everybody signs it, whoever is the beneficiaries and they, the court will accept that as uh, authority not to not to um, require your sister or whoever is the person. Well, it caused a fight because I've got a niece yep. here that's in Alberta, yep. and she's not happy. My sister. <laughs> that why is she doing it? She's not even our, your your niece. Yeah. She's only a niece in marriage. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so I okay. know. Found it's. It's not well, a business. Well, well, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's so like uh, family law all over again. Okay, yeah. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, well, just just one yeah. quick question from Jan. Just oh. had her hand up for oh, yes, a long time. Right. And then I'll ask her to hold off questions until <laughs> Dushko's finished talking, and then we can go again. Okay? okay. Jan, Sorry, go Jan. ahead. I think Dushko has to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, that's really good information. Thank you so much for that. Um, do, do you have any more to say about who you can use as an executor if you don't have any like younger family members or people that are, are close? You mentioned that a bank offers that service. And is there any any more? Like every bank, every chartered bank, every credit union, like where where can I find someone? 
Um, so there are financial institutions. I hesitate to say all financial institutions, but there are financial institutions. There are also private corporate executors. Uh, one that comes to mind off the top of my head is Concentra Trust. Um, but again, typically if the, if the documents are being prepared through a lawyer, if you just talk to your lawyer, then they would have a list of, of people that they would be able to um, contact on your behalf. Ultimately, it's up to you. So uh, we've had clients where we've sent them information from a couple of different institutions and they've, they go through and they decide based on the information provided to them who they want to act because it's you're still choosing who you want to act on your behalf. So um, ultimately, this, the decision is up to you. But I guess just as a basic, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very hesitant to say this because I know it's opening a can of worms, but you could just Google um, corporate executors in Alberta or in Canada or something like that. And that would just give you an idea, but basically they're all, they're all along the same lines. There's, there's not much difference. It's really just your preference. Thank you. Um, and if, if I may, um, your the speakers are coming through loud and clear, but on occasion, a question gets asked that we online, we, we don't get to hear what the question was. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, my apologies. I should have repeated the questions. I, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, so I just before Dushko, I will just say three things because it's a little bit confusing for people sometimes. So our services are 100% mobile, which means that we usually talk to you either through platforms such as uh, Zoom or some other online platform, telephone calls, emails. And uh, that's the way we gather the information. And when the documents are prepared, we bring them to you to sign. So it's a little bit different. You don't come into our office. We, we do come to you. I cannot say that all lawyers, I will not say that all lawyers would or do do that, but uh, it just because it says so, it says this on our card and people sometimes ask me about that after. So that's what that's referring to. And I thank all of you for your time and for, uh, for being here and allowing me to share it. I, th I think I think I think we if you guys have any other questions we can definitely turn this into an informal conversation and stuff and, and just to kind of touch base on on what what was talked about transmissions before and all that kind of stuff I'm going to shock you guys now um, you do not need to use a funeral home either to arrange for your, your funeral home, right should you use a funeral home of course Definitely, because when that stuff happens, it might be hard to organize a bonfire in the backyard just to perform the cremation and stuff like that, <laughs> right? Um, there, there, is also, there is also a lot of paperwork behind the scenes that needs to happen, right? The applications need to be sent to apply for burial permits. You need to contact vital statistics. You need to do a whole bunch of legal things in order to get that, to that point. And even then, like the, you definitely cannot do a, a barn barn fire in the backyard. You still have to get in touch with the funeral home to do the basic cremation uh, or, or whatever else you might need to organize for that. But just so you know, like you, you don't need the funeral home. Like you can, you can if, if somebody wants to, you can prearrange that. So I don't know how, because you can't prearrange, like you can't register with vital statistics about your passing when you're still alive. So whoever is your executor or whoever is in charge of, of your affairs would have to do that. And it, it, it's a process, it's a job. Absolutely. Yeah. So no questions? You, you just gonna you guys gonna let me talk for five minutes now? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Please. Sorry. Oh, no, no, question. that's okay. It's all good. Michael does have a question. Oh. So, so I'm just gonna ask um, um part of exactly an uh, incident I know about a person who did have a will. Um, but died very unexpectedly and had not done anything about burial and that. So, um, uh, so kind of who takes some response or what has to happen and who has to do that then? Um, you said that there was a will? And they had a will, but the will didn't say anything really about burial so much. Except the, the executors, one of the executor's duties is to, to organize and pay for the funeral. So, so that's it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Because power of attorney and, and personal directive, they, they stop 
be right. functional when the person passes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. when the executor or personal representative yeah, yeah, takes yeah, over, yeah. right? Right. So yeah. that would be the, the 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 thing. And I think what we're gonna what I'm gonna just show you guys is a couple of uh, I need to share the screen for that. There's going to be just a couple of, of slides with um, uh, some ideas about. Um, there are basically three ways that you can kind of handle these things. Uh, I'm just going to try to find them. Slideshow, come on, you can do it. Oh, no, this is coming. Sorry, guys, this takes a little bit of a, um, this takes a little bit of a, a, a juggling act, if you will. So um, let me see if you can find this. So th there is a couple of, couple of things like, um, what I would like to tell you today is what happens um, when a person dies, there are three scenarios, three ways that you can actually handle things. You would need to, let's see if I find this. So scenario number one would be that the, you spoke with the, with the funeral home ahead of time, you made your pre-arrangements, your executor grabs your will, grabs your personal documents, there is a pre-arrangement plan inside, that is the easiest way for them to handle that. Uh, because you clearly stated what your wishes are going to be, whether it's going to be a burial or, or a cremation. Um, you stated what kind of service you want or no, no service at all. And your wishes as far as the funeral home is concerned are very, very clear, very basic. Everything is, is there in black and white. There's no issues. Um, the second scenario would be that the funeral is prearranged, but it's not paid for. So that means that the, you talk with your spouse or you talk with your children or you actually go and visit the funeral home. Like I, I was just dealing with a lady that came to a funeral home in 1995 and talked with somebody and they told her that whatever service she wanted was $700. Well, I'm sorry, but it's not $700 anymore. If she would have prepaid for it in 1995, yes, it would have been $700 today. But so. That would be one of the conundrums about that kind of stuff. Because you can talk, your kids can know your wishes, uh, um, everybody might uh, uh, have an understanding of what you want. But if the service has not been paid, then the executor has to provide uh, funds to the funeral home for, uh, for that particular service. The third scenario, and this is definitely the worst one, is that you are feeling very skittish about your own mortality and you do not talk about that, like it's, uh, it's a bad juju, uh, the, uh, the bad spirit's gonna come and take me in the night if I ever mention a word funeral. Doesn't happen, uh, unfortunately. So you, you, unfortunately. You, you, don't, <laughs> you don't talk to anybody about that and you do not pay for it, I know, right? Fortunately, unfortunately. See, English is not my first language, so I'm allowed to have these mistakes, right? Like, it's all for because if, if you guys upset me, I'm going to start talking Croatian, then nobody will know what the presentation is about. <laughs> no, it's, okay. it's a good laugh. Right? <laughs> so you, you did not talk to anybody and you did not pay for it. Um, absolutely worst case scenario because now you have your executor in a position that they have no idea what you want. Uh, is it going to be a cremation? Is it going to be a burial? What did our family do in the past? Oh, I don't know, uh, grandma, grandpa were uh, traditional, so there was a burial, but I remember there was an ant there in Nova Scotia that was cremated. What do we do? Um, in these situations, uh, especially if there is more siblings involved, like say that the deceased person had five or six kids, and then all of them come because they all want to help, and they're all sitting in a funeral home, um, that's, that's when we just want to cry. <laughs> because there's no direction to us absolutely whatsoever. And it's not up to us to decide what's going to happen with your loved one's uh, deceased body, right? So um, that kind of creates definitely the problems. Um, not to mention that the longer you prolong that, uh, you're not making that decision clear, 
um, financially, you're you're dipping into any life insurance policies that you might have left for your significant others or for your kids or things like that, right? So, um, in order to avoid the um, inflation or anything like that, the scenario number one is the best case scenario, not just for for uh, for yourselves but also for the funeral home because we don't have to. The, the least amount of work we have to do is with that particular case. Um, the funeral homes will accept pre-planning arrangements, uh, but they're not necessarily happy about that. That's a little secret that I'm telling you about, because especially when we're signing up younger people, right? Um, if, I, if I sign somebody that's in their late 30s or early 40s, chances are, unless something unforeseen happens, that they're going to live until the 80, 85 years old, right? So uh, they will end up saving a lot of money to their <laughs> to their estate if they do that kind of stuff. And the funeral homes will definitely honor that that stuff, that, the, the pricing that was uh, locked in, right? This is province of British Columbia, this is nothing. So, a lot of funeral homes will actually do um, a, a very, how can I say, like you have the, the, in the, in the um, packages that I gave you, there's an executor's checklist, which is what we used to kind of help out uh, get that executor started with any and all government uh, documents that need to be issued, um, applications. So we'll do application for um, federal CPP death benefit, uh, which is $2,500, so as long as a person worked and lived in Canada and contributed to CPP. Uh, we do spousal pension, uh, survivor's pension, what they call it, we will cancel deceased person's pension, uh, we'll cancel the healthcare, Blue Cross, um, start the process of canceling the social insurance number because we're notifying CRA about that. Um, the, the actual uh, social insurance number doesn't get canceled until the actual, um, I think we lost my, mm -hmm. it's probably that spirit that I mentioned before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm almost at the end of the, uh, the, the thing anyway, so. Start from the beginning, come on. Um, so we've mentioned this uh, as well, like this is, um, I, I'm sure it was one of the slides in my previous presentations, but uh, our company does not, Dignity Memorial does not just handle um, the business side of things, if you will. Like we, we have um, uh, resources that are available to family before and after the service. So free grief, uh, grief counseling for a year and a half, um, the free travel assistance if somebody's flying from somewhere to come and see you before you pass, or if they uh, want to come and participate, be there when the service is happening, we have uh, those services as well. Uh, we have something that's called the state fraud protection, and that's part of this process, but we also notify credit bureaus, and if somebody steals your identity 10 years after your passing, um, your family, all they need to do is call us and then our lawyers will deal with our corporate lawyers, not, not this young lady sitting next to me, but our corporate lawyers will deal with uh, with any possible issues, uh, like good luck trying to co collect money from a deceased person's estate, but who wants to deal with the with the uh, collection agencies and whoever, right? Like, not a fun thing. So those, those would kind of be just in a, in a very brief uh, brief way of duties and roles of an executor, just to kind of give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of information. Okay, I know we're we're running out of time, so if anybody has any questions, okay, can I go? Uh, Ken first, you're next. What if the executor doesn't have the financial capability, or the capacity to do what's expected? Um, in that, yeah. Can I speak you to can, that? You can answer yeah. that, yeah. I, I'll just give one piece and then Dushko probably has um, more to add to it. But one of the things also, uh, little known fact, uh, 
the financial institutions are required to pay any debts or expenses of the estate. So if my mom dies and she deals with, oh, where will put her, I'll put her at ATV. <laughs> Uh, I do not deal with ATV. I'm the executor. I'm not. My sister is. But uh, what I can do is what after I go to Dushko or, or wherever I go, I keep all of those bills and I take them to the bank that she deals with and they will pay them all. They will give you as the executor bank drafts to pay everybody. They will use those account, those funds that are in the account. All you have to do is provide them with the documentation you require. Generally speaking, it's a copy of the will, a copy of the death certificate, and then the invoices, and they don't give you the money, but they will give you a bank draft for whatever it is that you need to pay each of the bills. So the executor never has to be out of pocket unless there is no money in the estate or if the money is tied up. But typically, it's it's very uncommon that there isn't at least enough money to pay for the funeral expenses. So that's a whole another thing but but yeah as far as like immediate bills take them to the bank okay. don't pay them we're getting really close to the end jim if you have a question quickly how much is it to pre-plan her funeral that is such a such a, a good question and such a question that like it depends on so many variables like first do you want to be buried or cremated <laughs> see, yeah. this is very. We we have we have a, a free consultation. So yeah. if any of you guys want to do a consultation with me, we can do them over Zoom or WebEx, whichever works best for you. Or if you want to come to the funeral home and then see what the funeral home actually looks like, um, that that would be an, an option. Um, that way, you can anybody can see the actual presentation, what it looks like, and every moving part that's involved in that. Generally speaking, the average cost of, of a burial depends on the casket mostly. Like the caskets range from nine hundred ninety dollars to fifteen thousand dollars. So it all depends on 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 what your budget is, what your preferences are, right? That kind of stuff. So. You can you can uh, um, have like a, a very inexpensive casket, and, and then your burial would be around eighty seven, eighty nine thousand dollars max. It depends again a few things, but okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're we're done. We're it's twelve o'clock. Your timing is impeccable as always. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much uh, for both of you coming. It's really always such solid information and really really thank you guys thank thanks you for having so us much. yes uh, just, just want to remind you that next week is our christmas extravaganza which will be upstairs in the cafeteria uh, we will have a performer twiggy who will be uh, singing and leading us some christmas songs we'll have coffee and treats and all the rest of it so Please come, tell your friends, tell everybody. So what does a person need to do to get invited? <laughs> you know, I, I, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll engrave it and mail it to you right away. But uh, no, so, for the trees, please do come. Everybody is welcome, not just from the 2S LGBTQ community. Everybody is welcome. So if you have some friends that would like to come, please tell them to come along. Uh, thank you so much. The last word I want to say about uh, this presentation is, I always hear people say, well, that's not my problem. That happens after I die. <laughs> yeah. Having been an executor yeah. <laughs> for someone who took that attitude, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, please, these are really important documents. Uh, they need to be looked after. And if they do, it makes a whole process so much easier yeah. for you, your loved ones, your family and others. So again, thank you so much. Kent. You know, this is fantastic information, which we all need. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you online also. Bye, Jan. <laughs> Bye, Jan. <laughs>